This is Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and we are at the NEI Congress 2018 in Florida, and I have with me here today Dr. Roger McIntyre. We are talking about the cognitive effects of depression and what can happen uh, in terms of cognitive impairment. Dr. McIntyre, can you explain to us, you mentioned a term in your presentation, two terms actually, um, you referred to hot cognition and cold cognition. Can you describe the difference between those two terms? I'd be happy to, Sabrina. And this is a very important concept, which, which I think is really relevant to what we see clinically in our patients. Cold cognition refers to cognitive processes that are not emotionally valenced, they're not emotionally influenced, while hot cognition refers to the emotionally valenced or emotionally influenced cognitive processes. So, you know, I think examples, I think, illustrate it more than definitions. And an example would be if you're otherwise well and someone asks you to spell the word world backwards, uh, you rely on your working memory and you just spell world backwards. If you're someone who's depressed or someone who has maladaptive mood states, that's going to affect the way your mind thinks. Mm -hmm. In other words, we know many patients with depression have what's called rumination. Mm -hmm. They tend to fixate on often negativistic content. It's a real, they just can't seem to inhibit in their mind a brooding of sorts. And this is often very anxiety provoking and very depressogenic for many patients. That rumination is a disturbance in attentional control as well as executive function to inhibit that really unpleasant thought process. And so there's an example wherein the attention and the executive control is influenced by the mood state. That's a hot cognitive disturbance. Another very easy example I always use is when we ask patients about their life, uh, their memory of their life events or how they notice things in their environment, they're often negativistically biased. If you ask patients, when was the last time you felt well, they not infrequently will say, never, I haven't felt well in ever. Mm -hmm. But that's often not historically true. And that memory bias is how they believe. They believe things have been terrible their whole life. But that's an example where your recall bias has been valenced by your emotion. And this is the target of cognitive behavioral therapy, to target these, what they call cognitive emotional biases, we call it hot cognition. And the cold cognition is those enduring cognitive deficits that are independent of what your emotional state is. And I know that you mentioned in your presentation that half of patients who are in remission for depression continue to have experienced cognitive difficulties. Can you explain a little bit about why that might be happening? That's such a great question, and you're absolutely correct. It is about half of our patients have persisting cognitive problems, despite the fact there's no active mood symptoms. They otherwise are reporting a normal mood state. Their rating scale for depression indicates that they're in remission. The working hypothesis has been and is today that what's occurring here is a persisting core abnormality in the brain circuits that are relevant to cognitive function. Said differently, we can think about depression conceptually as a set of symptoms that are subserved by underlying brain circuit alterations. So maybe an overly simplistic characterization would be that the area of the brain that's subserving mood is improved, but areas of the brain subserving cognition have yet to be sufficiently improved or you know or mitigated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. consequently what we have is a scenario where patients for the most part will say i can process my emotions well my mood's been stable but i just can't focus i have no memory uh, i can't organize my notes and my day my day planner etc etc so this reflects an underlying core intrinsic disturbance in cognition the key part, part to this sabrina is that we have to think about cognitive disturbance not as a consequence of being sad, but as a, as, as a separate core disturbance in depression. I think it's fascinating that that key alone, you know, that that still persists, the cognitive um, impairment still persists long after. Now, I know you shared with us kind of a shocking slide in your presentation about the comparison between 
major depressive disorder and someone who's actually under the influence of alcohol to the point of intoxication. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what this slide said and what exactly that means? So one of the ways that we try to um, really alert ourselves to uh, an area of, in this case, depression that's important, is to benchmark it to uh, you know, uh, an indicator of severity. So it's one thing to say cognitive problems are common, that they persist, uh, but really, translationally, why should I really care about this? Why we care about this is because it's so functionally impairing. Mm -hmm. Society has already agreed that if you're operating a motor vehicle under the influence of a lot of alcohol, that's a problem. You're, you're functionally impaired. Mm -hmm. Depending on which jurisdiction you live in, which uh, you know, part of the world, what state, what province, etc., um, the, the actual threshold for what's defined as legal intoxication slightly differs. But in many parts of North America, a blood alcohol concentration, BAC, of 0.08 is the definition of legal intoxication. Yeah. Society has agreed you are functionally impaired, you should not be operating a motor vehicle. And when studies have been done in otherwise healthy control uh, uh, subjects who volunteer, who take alcohol to achieve a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08, that is legal intoxicated, no one's surprised to hear that they're cognitively impaired when we test them. Right. But what's really quite striking is that when you compare their performance, that is the intoxicated volunteers, to people with depression who are sober, who are just doing the test for you, who are 30 years old, you can't tell the difference in cognitive performance. So what I'm saying is, is that the cognitive performance deficit in depression is of a magnitude that is commensurate with what we see in someone who is legally intoxicated. And as a consequence, we have no other conclusion other than it is very severe, it's very relevant. That's a bold statement, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the evidence definitely mm -hmm. shows that. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the number of bouts of depression and overall cognitive impairment? This is something that which has been replicated many times, and for me it kind of falls into this category of modifiable factors. There's some factors that influence cognition that we can't do a whole lot about, like your age or you know, your past personal history. I can't change that when you're in my office and you're in your 30s and 40s. Um, but what we can change is a person's illness course. And each episode of depression comes with it, if you will, baggage. And one of the baggage that it comes with is a deficit of further cognitive impairment. And I showed a slide from a study from France where investigators uh, looked at over 8,000 people with depression in primary care. They all administered the Weschler memory scale. And what was so revealing is that with each episode of depression as part of major depressive disorder, there was a further decrease in their performance on this memory scale by about two to three percentage points across the first four episodes. That's sort of suggesting that you're losing cognitive potential with each episode, along with all the other problems of episode recurrence. But it also may help us understand what is a common observation, and that is many antidepressants don't work as well the second and third time around, and or patients don't function or do as well second or third time around. Mm -hmm. And we've often said to ourselves, maybe because the antidepressants are losing their efficacy. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's because the brain's been changing and now they've got more cognitive problems and therefore they can't respond as well to the treatment. So that's been interesting. Absolutely. I have just one more question. Um, and I know that this is something that you tend to be passionate about. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us um, about the relationship between obesity, inflammation, and cognitive impairment? Um, within the context of depression. There's, and I like the way you phrase it, within the context of depression, because there's a, there's a very large body of literature that exists outside of the psychiatry literature that indicates very clearly that obesity is anti-cognitive. It reduces cognitive performance, and obesity may be the consequence of impairment in cognition. For example, in problems with impulse control mm. can lead to chaotic maladaptive eating. We see this in ADHD, for example. But in depression, what we now know is that the majority of patients are overweight or obese. They have a much higher rate of obesity than the general population. And when you look at cognitive performance in people with depression, those that are obese are more impaired cognitively than depressed people who are non-obese. And we've learned through some sophisticated analysis that a large percentage of the overall cognitive decline in depression is because of obesity. So I always say obesity metastasizes to the brain, mm -hmm. probably through inflammation, through stress response hormones, maybe through insulin resistance. 
And taken together, this is a combustible mix of the brain, decreasing cognition, fuel forwarding a vicious cycle of more maladaptive eating and decreasing further cognitive function. So it speaks again to the importance of below the neck and above the neck in treating cognition. It seems like there's just such a strong reciprocal relationship there, and it's fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. McIntyre, and thank you for tuning in to another edition of the NEI Podcast. We'll see you next time. This podcast was brought to you by NEI Membership. You're busy caring for your patients, and you might not have time to keep up with the ever-changing treatments in mental health care. You don't have to. NEI Membership includes regular psychiatric news updates, CME activities on the hottest topics, and the most cutting-edge prescribing app available today. To learn more, visit the link provided in the podcast description.